Welcome to Business Line. China has started devaluing its tightly controlled currency this week. Following the decision in the world's second biggest economy, we focus on currencies this time, looking at the reasons and the consequences of changes in foreign exchange rates. Let's start from the very beginning and answer the basic question. How is the price of a currency determined? Well, the key factors are supply and demand. If there is a high demand for goods and services produced in a country, its currency's value would increase. Sounds simple so far, but actually it's not, as there are more factors to take into account. If markets are worried about the future of this economy, they tend to sell its currency, and that would lead to a fall in its value. This is how it works in floating exchange rate system, where the currency could increase in value, this is appreciation, or decrease, this is depreciation. But if the rate is fixed, the state has to take action, and it means deliberate devaluation. And this is what happened in China. China's central bank has devalued the yuan to its lowest rate against the US dollar in almost three years, and its biggest one-day drop since 1994, when China aligned its official and market rates. The lender cut its daily reference rate 1.9 percent, calling the change a one-off depreciation. Policymakers have stepped up efforts to support exporters on the back of data earlier this week, which showed exports tumble by 8.3 percent in July. The lender said its fixing will become more aligned with supply and demand. As a result of the strong yuan, because it's linked to the U.S. dollar, uh, Chinese exports have become very expensive. There, there, there was a study that in 10 years, uh, China's costs increased by 8.5 times. So China's manufacturing cost is only marginally lower than in the U.S. The move could help spur growth in the world's second largest economy, which is growing at its slowest rate for six years. Some economists said the devaluation was also designed to support Beijing's push for the yuan to be included in a basket of reserve currencies known as special drawing rights, which are used by the International Monetary Fund to lend money to sovereign borrowers. Now let's look at the purpose of a devaluation. Why would a country let its currency fall in value? Well, usually to try to boost its exports and decrease its inputs. How does it work? For example, a bowl of noodles costs 10 yuan. On Monday, foreigner paid more than $1.63 for it. On Tuesday, with a new exchange rate, the bowl was less expensive, around 158, and even less on Wednesday. And now calculate goods worth billions of dollars. According to the latest data, Chinese exports definitely need stimulus. These are the figures released just before the first decision was made to start devaluing yuan. A double data blow for China has left experts predicting the central bank will have to further stimulate the country's economy. The producer price index in July fell 5.4 percent from a year earlier, according to the National Statistics Bureau. It was a sharper drop than expected, the worst reading since October 2009 and the 40th straight month of price decline. Exports tumbled 8.3 percent in the same month, their biggest fall in four months. Two-thirds of global growth came from the emerging markets themselves over the last five years, and those economies have been slowing quite sharply. So Brazil and Russia have been in recession, or forecast to be in recession this year. So a lot of demand that for those natural exports from China have disappeared. But the picture is pretty much the same elsewhere. It's not just China, but other, um, should we say, um, countries with large trade positions are also going through the same problem. The country's consumer inflation rate hit its highest level this year in July, edging up to 1.6 percent from 1.4 percent the month before. The government said it was due to rising food prices. Beijing's target is about 3 percent. The gloom in the world's second largest economy could deepen this week as a raft of data is forecast to show renewed weakness in factories, investment and domestic spending. Sometimes devaluations are forced on a country when it can no longer defend its exchange rate. Russia gave up on keeping its exchange rate when markets went too far in selling the rubles. Therefore, the exchange rate to the dollar decreased. Devaluations can have a lot of negative effects. For example, inflation can go up and the confidence among consumers can go down. This is one of the reasons why Russia's economy shrank the most since 2009. The country's GDP contracted 4.6% in the second quarter from a year earlier. 
But that's also how Russia's energy giant Gazprom managed to increase its profits. The company sells its gas mainly in dollars, so weak currency means the price of gas in rubles rises. A weak ruble has helped to boost profits for Gazprom. The Russian energy giant beat expectations with a 71% jump in first quarter net profit to $5.9 billion. Gazprom sells its gas in dollars, so a weak currency means the price in rubles rises. That helped to compensate for a dip of almost 10% in the volume of sales, which is partly due to sanctions imposed by the West following Russia's actions in Ukraine. The price of oil is key in determining gas prices. Now that crude has dipped below $50 a barrel, analysts believe Gazprom's profits for the rest of the year will be weaker than the first quarter. Shocking news from Google this week. The said giant announced an amazing reorganization. Formerly, Google will even change the CEO and will become a part of a bigger structure. Don't Google it. It's as simple as ABC. This is it. This is IT. Lately, investors were worried many of Google's bets, like driverless cars, were starting to stray from its core business while not providing insight about future profitability. That's one of the reasons Mountain View decided to create a new holding company, Alphabet, to offer more visibility into ambitious new businesses. How will this work? Well, so far Google has operated like a huge ship. Now it will be reorganized into a real fleet, with each division becoming its own subsidiary led by a captain CEO, and owned by Alphabet. The list includes life science division Calico, investment arm Google Ventures, the Google X Labs, home automation unit Nest, and Fiber, which focuses on high-speed internet. The move will also provide the holdings newly appointed CEO and president, Google's co-founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin, with enough flexibility to acquire and shed companies as they see fit. What about the search engine? The mothership, which will still include services like YouTube and Gmail, will be handed over to Sundar Pichai, Google's current number two. Judging by the words of praise he got from Larry Page, he is the real star in this surprise overhaul. You might have never heard of him, but since last October, he was basically the man in charge for Google's main web products. Quite a career for this 43-year-old engineer born in Chennai, India. After studying at Stanford, Pichai got an MBA from the Wharton School of Business and landed in Google in 2004. His first assignment was the Google Search Toolbar. He then masterminded Google's foray into browser territory with the launch of Chrome, which later evolved into a fully-fledged operating system. In 2013, the big break, he inherited the responsibility of Android from original creator Andy Rubin. His handling of the mobile operating system must have pleased his bosses, who have just decided to appoint him Mr. Google. That was it. That was IT. And that was it for now. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.